Today on Between the Lines, how to discover your talents and passions in order to transform your life with my distinguished guest, Sir Ken Robinson. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick. Sir Ken is an internationally recognized leader in the development of creativity and human potential. His best-selling book, The Element, introduced the world to new concepts of self-fulfillment. Now with his latest book, Finding Your Element, he leads us on a quest to discover our true self and how to apply it to the life we were destined to live. I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old. And it was... You do, need to, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. The characters, the heroes in this book, are seekers of truth in, in a story that, that involved a lot of corruption. You don't get a chance to really talk about what's real. And that is the first thing to do. Sir Ken, it is such a pleasure to have you back on Between the Lines. Welcome to the show. It's a real pleasure to be back. Thank you, Barry. Uh, this book here is Finding Your Element, and it is all about discovering your natural aptitudes and combining it with your personal passions so that you can literally lead a life that you're destined to lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I published a book, the, the precursor to this book, uh, a few years ago. It was called The Element, How Finding Your Passion Changes Everything. And it's based on exactly that. You know, there, I know an awful lot of people uh, who don't really believe they have any special talents. Uh, they don't really much enjoy the lives they lead. They sort of get through the week and wait for the weekend. Uh, they, I remember saying it there that they don't enjoy their lives, they endure them. But I also meet people who absolutely love what they do and couldn't imagine doing anything else. If you said to them, why don't you change track and try something different for a while, they wouldn't know what you meant. They'd say, you know, but you know, this isn't what I do, this is who I am, this is me, this is my most authentic self. And I thought a lot about that. I mean, the, the common language you use is for that is that somebody's in their element. And so we took this idea and said, well, what is it? And it's, it's those two things. It's where talent meets passion. And the book had a great response, but then people start to say, well, how do I find it if I haven't found it? And, that's what led us to this, this sequel. And that's what's in here. This is the, the means to finding your element. And it has two things in it. It has exercises, literally. That, and I, when I say exercises, uh, you know, uh, things that you can put on paper, work out, and do. And it also has stories of people who have found their element. And I told you before the show, I said, I'm going to throw a little curve at you. And I'm going to do it right at the top here, OK, <laughs> Sir Ken? When you were talking in this book about the element, mm. you mentioned originally that you were thinking of the title being called the epiphany, mm -hmm. because it's that same kind of sense one gets when you feel that you're truly in your element, it feels like an epiphany. Yeah. When I finished reading this, I almost thought you needed another name for the book. And this is what I said. Do you find your element, or are you creating an openness so it can find you? No. And that's what I got out of reading this, was that what you're really doing, instead of searching for your element, even the exercises and the stories, you're opening yourself up yes. so that it could come in. Yes. I think that's very true. I, I say in this book that, the, that finding your element is, is a, a two-way journey. It's, it's an inward journey to discover more about yourself. And it's an outward journey to give yourself new experiences in the world around you. And, and it, it's the balance between the two. In fact, I also say there that the journey isn't quite the right word. A better word is quest, which I think speaks to what you're saying, which is, it, I mean, it, you can take a journey and know exactly where you're going to end up. You know, you can decide, I'm going to go from here to San Francisco. That's a journey. I know where it is. I'm pretty sure I'm going to get there. But with this, it, it's, it's a more open-ended sort of quest in the medieval sense. A quest is a journey you undertake with a purpose, but you're not sure of the outcome. You may not be completely sure what you're looking for. Uh, you travel purposefully and hopefully, and uh, you aim to discover something along the way, but you may not be sure at the beginning what it is. And I think this is like that, that uh, you can set out to find your element without being quite sure what it is. And sometimes, as you say, it finds you. 
And who better than a knight to know about a quest? Well, I suppose that's us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there was an interesting thing you brought out about passion. And, and I use this often too, and you brought them both out, so I want to discuss it. Mm -hmm. There is the element of passion, which like passion of the Christ means to struggle. Mm -hmm. And then there's the element of passion as it's used here to find that thing that you love that is uh, innate to your soul. In fact, I think part of the, the description you use, it, I want to read it exactly right, is to do something that feels so completely natural to you, that resonates so strongly with you, you feel that this is who you really are. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of passion you're talking about. But yet, you can't help but know that as you said with Quest, there is struggle mm -hmm. in order to do that. It is not a simple task and it's not one that you do and then stop it is one that you must continually reinforce yeah that's absolutely right you know the the, the idea of passion is very interesting the, the word itself has changed meanings almost 180 degrees I mean its original classical meaning is suffering as in the passion of Christ uh, it's gone it's come to mean over over time almost exact opposite it means fulfillment and enjoyment and uh, and something that resonates deeply with your energy, something that fires you up uh, and fills you up. Um, and, and finding that point w of intersection between aptitude, talent, and passion is, is what this is about. But, but as you say, it's not a straightforward process. And when I began to think about this book, I said, people kept saying to me, we had a great response to the original book, but I got all kinds of questions about, well, how can I find my element if I haven't, or my, how can I help my children, or people I care for, uh, apart from, you know, immediate family even. And, um, you know, there are a lot of self-help books out there which offer uh, kind of three or four steps. And I'm not being critical of them. I just feel that this isn't a 10-step program. I mean, as it happens, there are 10 chapters in the book. But I can't guarantee that you'll be in your element in chapter 10. <laughs> and, and, and the reason is it's a personal quest. What I've tried to offer here are some tools, some exercises, uh, some uh, processes and approaches which will help people think this through and, and go on the journey. But whether they complete it, uh, how far they get, is a matter of personal determination, value, and fortitude. And it's like any quest. And you say oftentimes those aptitudes are hidden. They're mm -hmm. like uh, it, almost like the oil rich that's hidden deep below. The resources of nature are hidden sometimes. And our passions and our aptitudes are often hidden beneath these things. And it goes back to even Out of Your Minds, the book I had yes. you on for, where yes. our own systems of education, of media, sometimes represses them even further beneath. So it's, yes. it's a difficult, it's not difficult in the sense that it feels so worthwhile, it feels good when you're doing it, but it is not something that's going to come easy. It's hidden. I think I've tried, for some, for some people sometimes, um, the discovery is uh, easier, sometimes straightforward. They, they find out quite early on that they, they have a particular interest and a passion and a, and a talent for something. But for many people, it's not like that. It, it, it is more of a struggle uh, and, and more of a search to find it. And the analogy is quite right, Barry. I, I feel that strongly, that, that human resources, if we can call them that, human talents are like the Earth's natural resources. They're often buried beneath the surface. You can, uh, you can be standing right on top of them and not know they're there. And it's why I talk about this being a two-way journey. It's a journey to discover more about yourself. Most people have a very um, scanty conception of their own aptitudes and talents. And often people find that the things they're good at, they assume everybody else is good at that too. They think, well, if I'm good at this, then presumably anybody can do it. And actually, that's often not the case, that we all are very different. We have very different natural talents and aptitudes. So it is about looking deeply within you for that and, and having the confidence that there's something there to find. And by the way, it's not only for the creative person. You make it very clear here that a person in their element could easily be the sewer worker or the sanitation person, the, as well as it could be the artist, the musician, the teacher, the accountant, the factory worker. Their element may, may be what they, I love the line you use, it may be how they make their living, or as you said, how they become rich. That could happen, but what will definitely happen is you'll become enriched. Yes. And I think 
That's the real key to finding your element, whether it's being the, the doorman at, at a hotel, if that's what you love to do to serve, you're enriched by the experience. And that's what this is really about. It, it's a very interesting point, this. You know, I, I, among the questions that people kept asking me in relation to the first book were things like, well, you know, who's going to, who's going to clean the offices? You know, who's going to uh, look after the sewers? You know, who's going to take away the trash? And there's an assumption built into that that everybody wants the same thing. And, and I, 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 I have actually examples in the book of of people who do those very jobs. I, I, I tweeted. I mean, since we last met, Barry, I have taken to tweeting. Uh, <laughs> so have uh, I, by the way, since the, we've last met. <laughs> it's a funny thing, isn't it? I mean, 10 years ago, you didn't have to tweet, and now you do. But, uh, as long as you're not taking to twerking, we'll be okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. I've, I've stopped at twerking. I tried it. It, it, wasn't, a good, it wasn't a good luck, honestly. <laughs> it's not a pretty sight. But I, I, I did that. I tweeted about that. I asked people if they could suggest jobs that other people love that they would hate. And it was amazing. We got hundreds of responses to it. And, and some were really surprising. You know, people were saying things like, teaching. I couldn't bear to be a teacher. It would drive me mad. And of course, in the same flow of responses, we got people who teach for a living and couldn't think of doing anything else. Uh, people who couldn't bear to be lawyers, people who couldn't think of doing anything else but law. And then we got the normal things, you know, people saying, like a proctologist, I couldn't do that. Well, proctologists do do that, and, and they get very fulfilled by the work they do. Uh, and I had somebody tweet in saying they've worked their entire life uh, in the maintenance of sewer systems. And, and they absolutely love it. It's vital work. It's fulfilling. We're all glad that people do it. And, and I actually gave an example of a lady in the book, a woman who has been an office cleaner for 30 years. She's raised a family, and it's just the part of the day she looks forward to most. She gets time on her own. Uh, it's the place where she can be herself. The building's empty. And she loves cleaning, loves getting straight, and loves the fulfillment that comes at the end of it. Well, I mean, I've taken for a while. I mean, you probably know I wear a brace on my leg. And so I've taken uh, latterly, because I travel a lot, uh, always have done, but I've finally given into a family intervention. I now get in wheelchairs when I go through airports because otherwise I slow the whole airport down, you know, so this, this is in everybody's interest. But uh, lastly, so I, you know, you get chatting to the people pushing the wheelchair. And it's very interesting to me how many of them uh, are just doing it to fill in, you know, they, it's not a job they particularly want, they're just doing it for some cash, they're probably college students or something. But a significant number do it because they love it. And they said, I've been doing this job now for 15 years. I can't wait to get here every day. And I said, why is that? And uh, I was talking to a guy the other day at LAX. He says, because I love to help people. Uh, I love to feel that I'm getting people off to a good start and I'm giving them the support they need. He said, I find it really rewarding. So it's the whole principle here is diversity and, uh, and recognizing that what fulfills you may not fulfill somebody else and, and vice versa. And it's finding that unique place in your own life that this is about. But isn't part of that also, though, isn't sometimes fear that steps in the way, almost a fear of discovering your element, mm -hmm. even though it's so worthwhile. I know that, and that it's funny because the element would be at the front of the frontal lobe, but the fear is in the back of the lizard brain. And yet fear of discovery, even that can enrich you, is something that people have to struggle with. Yes. Well, that's exactly right. There are all sorts of obstacles to this, and it's why I say in the book that there's, you know, I'm not offering any guarantees that this is about your journey. You see, there are, there are several principles that run deeply through this. And what, the first of them is that, that every human life is unique. And I, I mean that literally. I'm one of seven children. I have five brothers and a sister. We're very similar, but we're all different. Uh, I have two children. They love each other. They have a lot in common, but they, in some respects, they couldn't be more different. In fact, I make make people a bet these days if they've got two children or more. I bet that they're completely different, and, and they are. And we're different because we all are. We're different uh, in terms of our cultural experiences, our own biological mix. Uh, I'm a lot like my father, but I'm a lot like my mother too. I'm not a clone of either of them. You know, I'm a kind of unique blend. We all are, that, that's the point. So discovering your own uniqueness is part of this. It's the second is that we create our own lives and that we can recreate them. Every, every single resume is different. Nobody has ever had your life, no, nobody's had my life, or nobody's ever had the life of anybody watching this program. And the life you have is the one you've made. You've created it, and you can recreate it too. And the third big principle in the book is that life isn't linear. 
it's organic. The fact that it's organic, that you almost, as, as obvious as it would be, yeah. you never hear it that way. No, as they say, it's not over till it's over. And you know, people often persuade themselves that life is linear. You know, because there, there, there come occasions when they have to write a resume and, uh, and they set it all out on one side or two sides of paper with some key dates and put certain things in bold or italic. Uh, and it all looks as if they've been living their life, and we all try to do this, according to some predetermined plan that we figured out at school. And of course, it's not like that at all. I was asking, uh, I was with a group of people yesterday, there were about 300 people in the room, and I asked them how many of them, are, they're all in their 40s and over, were living the life that they anticipated they'd be living when they were at school at 15. Not a single hand went up. It never does. I mean, sometimes people say, well, I always wanted to be a veterinarian, and I am one. But this life, this place, these people, these children, these friends, of course, you can't plan any of that. The truth is, every life is a kind of improvisation between your talents and dispositions and your circumstances. And so every life turns out to be un continually unfolding. And what that means is that it's not too late. You can do something about all of this. But you're quite right, there are big obstacles. And one of them is people have uh, deep self-doubts. You know, will they look foolish if they try something different? Will they uh, break with other people's expectations of them? Will, it f will they fall flat? And then there are other people's constraints, other people's views and opinions of them. So I'm, I'm not trying to make this sound like a fairy tale. I mean, I'm living in this world just as you are, and you know that you have to confront all kinds of things. So it's partly that we're trying to set out in the book as well. You also talk about energies, the physical and the spiritual. And again, the more you can endemic within you, make it viscerally one. Yeah. I know that sounds funny, but the physical and the spiritual become one, and the mental and the physical become one. It seems that you begin to open yourself up more to again that quest of the element that brings together your passions yes. and your aptitudes. Well, th this idea of energy is very important. I mean, in the end, life is energy. That, that's kind of all it is. And you're right, I make a distinction in the book between physical and spiritual. And if you're in your element, uh, several things happen. Well, one is that, uh, that you get energy from it. And I find this very interesting. You know, I sometimes look at other people and the things they do and wonder how they get through the day. I mean, I sometimes look at politicians you know, who dash around continuously, you know, from jumping on airplanes and going to meetings. I do that, by the way, at the same time, but, you know, but, <laughs> but I couldn't do what they do. And, and you think, you know, that would exhaust me. And yet they seem energized by it. That's literally what's happening. They're energized by it. Other people, uh, you, 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 you know, they might be teaching 40 children all day long, and you might look at it and think, I couldn't do that. But they are energized. The difference I'm getting is, if you're in your element, you may be physically exhausted, but spiritually uplifted by it. If you do things you don't care for, you can be physically fine, but down. But so finding things that feed your, your spiritual energies is really what this is about. But isn't some of the things you alert us to is that, again, go back to that fear of people feeling that they don't even have a passion. Yes. That to me is the hardest obstacle to overcome if you feel, I, listen, I'm just not that passionate about something. Yeah. And yet you tell us, no way, again, go beneath the surface, go you know, beneath and find those resources. Everyone has a passion and everyone does have the aptitude to fulfill it. Or, or more than one, I mean, it, it, it's not like there's a limit on this. Uh, but I think you're, you're right to point to this because um, sometimes people think of passion uh, in the same context as like flamenco dancers, you know, people dashing around with castanets and sweating and you know, roses grip between their teeth and their eyes flashing. I mean, it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, I mean, what, what I mean by passion here is something that feeds your spiritual energy and where you are drawn to it and actually love the process of doing it. And, uh, and, and again, it can be anything. It, it, it can be teaching, it could be writing on your own, it could be doing construction work. It's the thing where, where you get lost, where time shifts and you, you feel it your most natural and resonant self. You also have a line where you say, moving forward 
by going back. And you use it in a specific thing. You say that one important reason, and you mentioned this, is by keeping your options open, is that you're not limited to that one element for life. But I went one more step forward because I think also, even when you find your element and are moving forward within that, you will also have setbacks. That's, mm -hmm. Isn't that the truth? So you, you've got, and then that would lead to a second guessing almost. So you have to almost be careful about that. You yes. have to be aware that no matter what, there's going to be setbacks in the external world, as you said, as far as the world that you have no control of, as well as within the internal world, the, what you have control over, you still can feel those setbacks. Well, that's right. And uh, you know, I have a whole section in the book on happiness. It, it's, it's very interesting, but if you ask most people what they want from their lives, somewhere in the first couple of sentences, the word happiness will show up. Yeah. And uh, and one of, the, one of the issues here, and the reason I have a whole chapter in the book about this, is that uh, people have all kinds of misconceptions about what happiness is. They confuse it with cheerfulness or with uh, partying and, and good times and hanging out. And all those things, of course, can be very pleasurable. Uh, but you can party all you like and still be very depressed at the end of it and wake up the next morning and when the hangover clears up, you're still down. Uh, happiness is... Is a, is a state of well-being. And sometimes people confuse it with money, you know, with wealth. I'm not arguing for poverty, but, but there's no correlation between, uh, between money and, and happiness in the, in the general way. I mean, if, if, if there were, then the richest people in the world would be the happiest, and they're not, and the poorest people would be the least happy, and they're not. Uh, happiness is not a material state. It's a, it's a spiritual state. It's a state of well-being. And and it speaks to your point, really, that it's not a steady state. It's not continually rising. It's a, it's a, it's a, a fluid state. You can be up and down. And, but, but if you're doing things you love and care for, if you're living a life that has purpose and meaning that you find fulfilling, then you're much more likely to be resilient to the knocks and the obstacles that you reach. You're, you're less likely to be put deeply down by them because you know that you're on the right sort of path. See, I, I, I'm guessing this. I mean, I, I asked you about this, but I... I imagine it to be true, you know, that you're clearly in your element doing what you do. And, and you're very good at it and you have a passion for it. And I'm sure time passes quickly when you're doing this. Uh, and I'm equally sure uh, is, that, is that you also suffer all kinds of frustrations and obstacles and so on in the interests of doing what you do, you know, scheduling and running a program and all the myriad things that go into making this bit of it possible. But you're still, I imagine, it's a question really, fundamentally happy in what you're doing, despite all the frustrations it inevitably would bring to you. It is when I am able to see it that way. But just like all humans, I have to constantly reframe it. You're absolutely right. In fact, I, this is my element. I didn't have to find it. it and by the way, it did find me. I, yes. it, it, it was kind of a weird thing how, how it even occurred. Well, what, but, what did it care? The, the, the show even, the, the, the yeah. thing that I'm doing, it, it found me by accident almost. I, I, the truth was I was looking for someone else to do this. I was a producer <laughs> and they told me that they didn't have any money to hire anybody else. So I ended up, all right, I'll do it. And then it became a passion. So it wasn't my passion starting no. out. That's, an in, that's another thing we could discuss a little yeah. bit. You don't necessarily start out with your passion. Sometimes you have to do all sorts of things before it pops up, and as I go back to earlier, before it quickly finds you. Yes, that's right. And, and it's, it's why originally uh, we had this idea of calling the book Epiphany, the, the, the original book, The Element. But the reason we pulled away from that was because the Epiphany carries with it the idea of a sudden revelation. That can be the case. For some people it is that. You, you suddenly come across them, you think this is it. Other times, it's, it's more like falling in love over time with something, you know, that it, it, it kind of grows on you. But the, the, it seems to me one of the important points that comes out of your own experience is that, that, is that you have to be open to the possibility. I mean, you could have said, couldn't you, when this came up, this opportunity, you could have said, absolutely not. You know, I can't do that. No, I'm a producer. Uh, this, is, this is not me. I can't do it, or I won't do it. But something in you was open to the possibility 
And if you're open to the possibility of it, then you're much more likely to discover this thing. You know, K Sir Ken, you said when you are in your element, the time flies and our time has Already? flown. <laughs> I know. I, I haven't even gone through half the things that are make the people read the book. It'll be perfect. But I want to end with these words of yours. Finding your element is about discovering what lies within you and in doing so, transforming what lies before you. Sir Ken, the bottom of my, my heart, thank you so much for helping all of us discover our element. Thank you, Brian. It's my pleasure. Oh, and thank you guys for joining us. Now, before Sir Ken leaves, I'd like to leave you with these words from Finding Your Element. All quests involve risks, and you can't anticipate them all. They involve opportunities, too, and you can't foresee all of those either. You can only set a direction and take the first steps. You then need to stay open to risks and to the possibilities and be willing to respond. To both. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between the risks and those opportunities, keep your mind open and you will find your element. Thank you so much, Sir Ken. My pleasure. Closed captioning for Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible by your generous contributions to KLCS Education Foundation. Thank you for your support. Please visit us at klcs.org slash btl if you would like to contact Barry or watch an episode of our show online. And go to barrykibrickblogs.com to go further between the lines and read Barry's posts. <laughs>